Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined in today for a very interesting panel discussion on neuroethics and AI in the global context. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating this session today as part of Brain Awareness Week by the Center for Cognitive and Brain Sciences, IIT Gandhi Nagar. Um, so thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Jayashree Das Gupta, the co-founder and project director of Samvedna Senior Care, um, where I work with age-related issues and neurodegenerative disorders. Um, I am a neuropsychologist uh, with, and I hold a PhD from uh, Nimhans Bangalore. And I'm very interested uh, in the area of neuroethics. I lead a project at Sangat supported by the Global Initiative in Neuropsychiatric Ethics based at Oxford University. And um, some of the areas that I'm interested in are the ethical and social issues of cognitive enhancement and adoption of technology for mental health disorders in low and middle income country settings. Um, I'm a member of the International Neuroethics Society um, Diversity Inclusion Task Force and Program Committee. And it's a real honor to introduce our very um, distinguished panelists for today. Um, Dr. Kel Meyer is a neurologist at the University Medical Center Freeburg, where he heads the neuroethics and AI lab, ethics lab at the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, he studied medicine in Heidelberg and Zurich and received a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. Um, he's a scientific member of the Brain Links Brain Tools Cluster of Excellence at the University of Freeburg and research fellow in Responsible Artificial Intelligence research group at Freeburg Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, his neuroethical research focuses on ethical, legal, social, and political challenges of neurotechnologies, big data, and artificial intelligence in medicine and research. And he's also an affiliate of the Institute for Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine in University of Zurich, where he teaches biomedical ethics. So it's absolutely wonderful to have you uh, here today. Um, our second panelist uh, is Dr. Laura Specker Sullivan. She's a specialist in interdisciplinary and cross cultural ethics in technology and medicine, um, an assistant professor of philosophy at Fordham University. She's held fellowships at Center for Bioethics, Harvard Medical School, the Center for Sensory Motor Neural en Engineering at University of Washington. Neuroethics Canada at University of British Columbia and the Kokoro Research Center at Kyoto University. Uh, she's a member of the program and nominating committees for the International Neuroethics Society, a member of the IEEE Brain Initiative Neuroethics Team and a member of the Philosophy and Medicine Committee of the American Philosophical Association. Um, so thank you so much for uh, joining today. Um, our third panelist is Dr. Laura Cabrera. She's an associate professor at the Department of Engineering, Science and Mechanics and core faculty of the Center for Neural Engineering, Pennsylvania State University. She's also chair in neuro neuroethics at Huck Institutes of, of the Life Sciences and a research associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. Uh, she's a member of the Association Mexicana de Neuroethica, chair of IEEE Brain Neuroethics Subcommittee, and member of the International Neuroethics Society Emergent Issues Task Force. So uh, thank you again for uh, joining us today and uh, taking out time for this uh, very important discussion on um, neuroethics. So, uh, you know, we have a very mixed audience of students and professionals today. And since neuroethics is a fairly young field that many may not be familiar with, um, I wanted to begin by just asking each one of you, you know, what exactly is neuroethics and, and how did you become inspired to work in this area? So maybe we begin with Dr. Um, Kelmeyer. Yeah, hi. Um... So hello everyone and thanks for the very kind um, introduction. It's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be able to speak to you um, today. So thanks again very much for the, for the kind invitation. Yes, yeah, so neuroethics um, is for me, I think we will hear uh, different um, uh, definitions or operational descriptions 
uh, from the other speakers and that's kind of makes it very interesting um, because it is in my view a field that is highly interdisciplinary I would say it's um, you know part applied ethics um, part sort of very close to or maybe very similar to to other fields of applied biomedical ethics um, bioethics um, but it also shares uh, intersections with um, other uh, emerging fields like uh, AI ethics digital ethics um, because I think at heart it lies at the sort of intersection of neuroscience, neurotechnology, cognitive science, uh, clinical applications, um, neurology, psychiatry. And since these are all converging in highly, highly dynamic research fields, um, it's, uh, it's a great uh, and opportune time to do neuroethics because um, our brain has become subject of a lot of interest to many uh, different stakeholders and parties, not only in the clinical domain, but also in the consumer uh, neurotechnology domain. Um, so a lot of interesting <clears throat> ethical questions in the way in which we uh, conceptualize the brain uh, and um, um, also the way in which we access uh, and use brain data, for example. So I think for me as a clinical neurologist and somebody who works um, also in the clinical translation of AI-based neurotechnologies, there are uh, you know, endless uh, number of really interesting and, and difficult ethical uh, questions. Um, but for me, uh, it's not only about the ethics, um, but also uh, discussing and finding ways um, of how to build effective governance frameworks um, for these emerging uh, technologies because um, you know ethics is, is important and there can be a lot of discussion on that but ultimately what it also comes down to is uh, effective um, regulatory frameworks that safeguard uh, individuals uh, from harmful effects of these technologies uh, and so trying to work in all these um, Directions together with wonderful colleagues such as uh, uh, Professor Speck and Professor Cabrera. Thanks a lot, Doctor. Uh, and and I think as you as you mentioned, you I think everyone on the panel has come from very diverse backgrounds, which is really interesting. Um, Doctor uh, Specker, could you, um, I mean, what what is neuroethics for you, and uh, what inspired you to work in this area? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'll echo some of what Philip just said, um, but I think essentially neuroethics for me is addressing values in neuroscience, neurology, and neurotechnology. And I mean that broadly, one of the things I love about neuroethics is we're not just talking about neuroscience techniques that are established, and then we think about their implications on society, but addressing how human values and priorities and goals are already wrapped up in how we design scientific research projects, how we conceive of neurotechnology. So it's something that really starts with human values that go into the science and then human values that come out of the science. And I love thinking about that. I find it so fascinating. Um, I know we have a lot of students in the audience. And so I'll say part of what drew me to this area is when I was an undergraduate in college, I was really interested in neuroscience um, and I thought that I was going to go into a field where I was working in a lab and I had my first day of trying out work in a neuroscience lab where there was a rat that was on a ventilator and its brain was open and there was a lot of blood and I passed out in the hallway um, and immediately realized, okay, maybe this isn't a thing I can do. Um, to be fair, I think you can get past that. But at the time, I, it, for me, I was already thinking, I don't know that I want to do bench science, but I love thinking about uh, values and um, kind of like the human dimension of science and medicine. And so it was a really nice field for me to fall into. And I think it's a great option for people who love thinking about science and medicine, but maybe don't actually want to do the hands-on work themselves. That's, that's really interesting. Um... And, and I know you do a lot of uh, cross-cultural work, which, um, you know, I'm sure that's going to, uh, you know, like be something that we'll be talking about a bit more later on. But um, Dr. Uh, Cabrera, what, I, I know you do work in a very different um, environment as well. What, what, what is neuroethics for you and what uh, inspired you to work in this area? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the kind invitation. And I think I echo many things of what... Um, 
Dr. Kilmeyer and Dr. Spikasali have mentioned already, is this interdisciplinary field where you really bring all the brain sciences broadly construed because as we heard before, you know, includes things like neurology, um, neuroscience, neurotechnology. So I like that combination that you can really bring all the different fields that look at the brain, examine the brain, manipulate the brain, bring them together and analyze or examine the, the ethical social implications of, of that. And I think for me, it's a combination of, because the values aspect, but I, I think I started mostly thinking as an engineer, because that was my background, thinking, okay, great, we are doing these great technologies, but you know, what are the implications of our work to society and to individuals? And, and that question really triggered my interest in pursue ethics more um, in depth. And that led me later to um, participate in this neuro bootcamp led by Marta Farah at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where it was neuroscience for non-neuroscientists. And it was just great to be there. That, that was the key thing that led me to go, I wanna do neuroethics instead of, at the time I was doing nanotechnology. So it, it really shifted uh, my path uh, to, to neuroethics. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite, quite a shift. And, and, and I think as, as all of you mentioning it, I think it's a whole multidisciplinary um, you know, nature of this area that, um, it, that I, I personally, I think it's it's really exciting, um, and it's also really interesting to you know to you know how you're talking about values and the way that we're you know that's so core to a lot of um, the work that we do. Um, but to kind of move on to uh, you know what we want to talk about today in terms of AI and neuroethics, um, we've seen a lot of ad advancements in AI in the recent past. And, you know, I, I just wanted to ask each of you, what do you think are the key advances in AI? Um, and, and how do you think this is gonna impact you know, our lives in, in the next three to five years? Um, Dr. Kelmeyer, would you like to um, begin? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think AI, um, broadly construed, um, is already really an important part of our everyday interactions with digital technologies. So each time you perform uh, a search on the web or you use um, navigational tools, maps, um, when you use voice assistants um, uh, for uh, any task, these are all um, technologies that already use um, the core technology behind um, AI, um, artificial neural networks um, for deep learning already today in everyday um, devices um, like smartphones. And what we've seen in recent years is that this surge in um, um, artificial neural network applications uh, all also has broad applications in neuroscience. So using um, deep learning for analyzing brain signals, for example, things like EEG data, but also other brain data, uh, has really shown uh, that this can be a superior approach to traditional types of um, data analytics and machine learning, much like in any um, other sector and other fields. So you already see this, um, this very, um, substantial transformation um, of neuroscience research, um, not so much yet uh, in clinical practice, um, but soon these types of um, uh, data and machine learning driven analytics will also be a um, routine part of medical practice, where you will have AI-based uh, diagnostic uh, uh, assistive systems, you will have um, service robots um, that are operated um, either by brain computer interfaces that use AI based um, signal analytics um, or other types of um, um, devices, uh, robots and so forth. Uh, so the opportunity, uh, but also the challenges uh, for everyday human AI interaction um, is already um, growing and will will also be a substantive factor in, uh, in neuroscience and neurotechnology. And so it's really um, a challenge for, for everyone who's involved in AI research, uh, uh, whether foundational or applied, um, to work on how we can better understand um, how human AI cooperation, uh, human AI interaction can be um, optimized to support human needs, uh, to protect vulnerable populations, um, to promote human flourishing. And I think that will be the big challenge for the next um, 
coming years to better understand uh, the way these systems work, uh, so to increase interpretability, explainability of AI systems, but also to make sure that um, from the very uh, beginning we design them in such a way that they optimally um, uh, uh, can be optimally used to support our needs and our priorities. Um, and that's a long way to go, but it's a very exciting research field. And I think neuroethics can help a lot in sort of um, shaping the way in which this development um, is going. Right. And, and I think that's, um, I mean, you spoke about how important it is to incorporate that uh, consideration of these various ethical aspects right now as the science is developing. Um, yeah. I, you know, neuroethics as a field, at least in India, it's it's fairly new. I, I know that it's great that we're talking about it today. I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, ha how you see that actually um, being incorporated globally um, in, in, in research. Um, I, I mean, uh, or if someone else on the panel would want to kind of respond to that. Yeah, uh, sure, maybe. Um... Laura? <laughs> Which hey, Laura? <laughs> um, well, it's just one of the things, I mean, this is maybe going a little bit into the some of the social concerns with AI is that um, one of the common misconceptions people have about AI, right? So AI is artificial intelligence. Um, a common misconception people have about AI is because it's not human thinking, it's not biased and it doesn't have cultural beliefs and it doesn't have uh, kind of like social relationships and that kind of thing. Um, and I think part of the downside of that is there's this idea that you could take an AI technology, some kind of machine learning that's been developed in the United States and you can use it in India and there will be no problems, right? And it's just transplantable from one place to another. Um, and I think increasingly what we're gonna see is a sensitivity to developing AI technology for very specific tasks in very specific places based on specific needs. Um, and so I think that that's something to keep in mind is just the way that there is this tendency to take a technology and transplant it from one context to another. And that can lead to kind of unanticipated problems. Um, and it's something that I think researchers are increasingly sensitive to. And, um... I mean, what, what do you think are the, the most significant, um, you know, advances that will probably impact um, us in the next couple of years? Yeah, well, so I was going to say, I think it's helpful, again, to um, the thinking about AI, to think about it as it can do things that humans can't do because it's artificial. It can also do things that humans can do. Um, and so in the realm of things people can't do, I think AI is really good at handling big data. Right? So big data is um, data that are data sets that are very large, they're very messy, and they change very quickly, which means that it's hard for humans to analyze them. It's also hard to analyze them using statistical methods. Um, you see a lot of this in brain data. Um, what AI can do is it can analyze that data and create an output that actually someone can use in a clinical practice or in a research practice. People have already used it to um, analyze like certain like MRI output. So instead of being analyzed by a human being, that might be analyzed by an AI technology. I think that's gonna change um, a lot of our practices in medicine and especially in neuroscience. Um, the place I think that we need to think a lot about is the things that humans can do. So there's been development of AI that can produce natural sounding language. Um, there is an interest in AI that can perform care work that can do creative work, like things that we think are uniquely human and that humans need to do. I think the more that we try to incorporate AI technology into those uniquely human things, the more we're not just gonna take over human jobs, but we're actually gonna see the nature of those jobs changing. That, that's really interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold that thought there. And I think that's something we might wanna discuss a bit more uh, later on as, as well, but maybe, uh, Dr. Cabrera, if I could turn to you and ask, what do, what do you think are the, you know, the, the major advancements that would impact our lives um, in the next three to five years? And do you see this happening globally or is this going to be more um, you know, region specific? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, 
Laura, the other Laura already kind of point to some of these issues, uh, which is that first the, the issue of how, you know, beyond translating things from the US to India, we already seen within each country or within each region, the way we train the data is already creating biases that are important to look at. So that's uh, one thing. In terms of, um, you know, like uh, the, the things that I see as important to consider going forward is that, I mean, the development of this is not equal. So as you said, you know, uh, the field of neuroethics is fairly new in, in India, for example. And so the fact that we are not, um, we are developing this in, in like different paces and people are incorporating ethics and others are not. So that could lead to things that we might want to think of in terms of, you know, the type of AI that we develop because it has, again, social uh, repercussions. And one area that I'm really I'm thinking it's really going to impact us that perhaps we'll discuss a little bit later is, you know, how using these, um, some of the AI that we have currently is fairly, you know, it's, it's still basic, so to say, like it's not very advanced, so it's easy to recognize kind of what's going on. But as we develop more strong AI, where it's really going to be hard to determine, you know, wh why does that system create this output? I think that's going to bring really important challenges to responsibility and accountability. So that's what I think is going to be a major issue. And um, maybe if I can add, because you specifically asked about um, sort of the global aspect or international aspect um, of neuroethics. So I think neuroethics is a fairly comparatively young uh, emerging academic field, but there has been a lot of activity uh, in recent years um, to internationalize it, um, to diversify it, um, to increase cultural um, diversity and bring in perspectives from all over the world. And um, I think Laura Specker Sullivan can, for example, uh, speak more to that, but just as one uh, point of reference has been a global um, neuroethics um, summit and posting the um, posting the URL here. Uh, in the chat so people can check this out. There's also, of course, the International Neuroethics Society, with which all three of us are involved in, uh, in various committees and leadership positions. And so um, there is a lot of um, possibility um, to, you know, to join the global neuroethics uh, community and family um, um, if people were interested. Um, and I think that's also important to uh, sort of harmonize um, efforts and to make sure that uh, um, pressing uh, concerns and topics um, are on the agenda and not only for specific regions of the world, but that uh, concerns about the well-being um, um, uh, in relation to uh, to the brain are, um, you know, there's more awareness um, in all parts of the world. So, and this will, I hope, um, continue in the next coming years that we, that, you know, people will join from more regions of the globe uh, to make this more international, more diverse. Um, joint effort yeah. yeah i think I, I mean thank you for sharing the link uh with everyone because i think that's uh, that's a really great resource and something that you um you know people listening in who um you know should really look at it i, I think it's 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 a great uh resource so thank you for sharing that um i, I think maybe uh, um I, I know a lot of your work you've you've looked at various ethical legal social um you know concerns about um, you know, various advances in AI. And I, um, I, I really wanted to understand uh, from you, what, what do you see as the major concerns in each of these areas? I mean, if you could just highlight some of those for um, the people who are listening in. Dr. Kelmeyer, would you, ah. I know a lot of your work is specifically uh, yeah. because, because you looked at some of that. Yeah, so I'm particularly interested in the in the sort of interaction between AI systems uh, and humans because I think it uh, poses very, you know, profound questions um, uh, on on sort of both at a sort of ontological level. So the question of what is an AI system in relation to uh, what a human being is um, as an entity. Um, in terms of like how do we encounter uh, a, such, a system that is highly adaptive um, that can sort of perhaps understand um, <clears throat> uh, understand more about us than, than we would perhaps like or that we can sort of um, fully grasp um, 
but also sort of the, the level of what we can know about an AI system of how it works internally um, and how our behavior is guided by, uh, by what the system does and about, and about how our behavior might influence uh, the way a robot, uh, AI-based robot, for example, behaves. Uh, because it turns out that you know that it, these might be very different kinds of intelligences uh, that that uh, uh, are at play here. So obviously, as uh, Laura already pointed out, um, you know, typical deep neural networks that are used in AI applications today are really really good uh, at big data analytics, at making uh, pattern recognition, uh, making inferences on large amounts. Um, of data, but human intelligence is, you know, more multi-dimensional. It also has social dimensions. Uh, it has emotional dimensions. Um, it has um, all kinds of capacities that are not necessarily um, formulable in, in machine learning terms, or that cannot be easily translated uh, into the frames of reference that uh, that an artificial system um, has. And by so by reducing um, our interactions with these systems to the analytical level, there's a real um, danger also in the way in which is, this is um, framed. So consider, for example, the, the you know diagnostic um, systems, AI systems in medicine that are now coming up in dermatology uh, for skin cancer. They are often framed uh, in, in in terms of competition. So AI systems are becoming better than dermatologists or better than radiologists um, in detecting, for example, skin cancer or lesions in radiological images. Um, and I think that's an, that this is an unhelpful um, uh, framing, an unhelpful um, way of, of sort of in, uh, including these systems into our lives, because ultimately uh, the other position would be to say, okay, these are just very interesting um, analytic tools um, and not social others and not like, you know, social entities, but that we should consider um, something like a deep neural network or a robot just as a kind of very interesting and sophisticated and complicated um, tool um, that could help us um, to, um, you know, make better diagnoses or improve medicine uh, or pursue specific human goals. But we should not uh, let our own priorities and our own goals be um, necessarily guided um, by by these kinds of technological um, developments. So there's a kind of related also to the problem of uh, sociologists call technological solutionism. Uh, the, the idea that if you're presented with a particular problem in, in the social arena, for example, shortage of care staff um, in care homes and things like that. Um, if the only thing that you're turning to is always technology uh, and you do not look at, at uh, um, social innovations or ways in which you could change um, institutional um, policies or procedures or um, maybe um, promote uh, human uh, workforce um, or structure processes in other ways, uh, you are narrowing your options um, because you're always turning to technology to solve your problems. It's a little bit like in climate change. People say, okay, we've got too much uh, pollution now in the air. Now we need a new technology that can, that can eliminate the pollutants uh, from the air, rather than saying, oh, we need a radical change um, of policies, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, post-growth um, economy and so forth. And so the solution uh, for these kinds of problems in medicine, in the social arena, does not necessarily always lie with, with AI or with neurotechnology, but might sometimes be better addressed in, uh, by social innovations. Uh, and I think neuroethics can be, can be helpful uh, in identifying where human AI cooperation rather than competition can be really helpful for uh, improving situation, uh, the lives of, of individual people. Um, also in terms of structural and social injustices, because uh, obviously these kinds of technologies are expensive and they cannot be used in, in every context. And so they might even um, uh, worsen existing social inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities. And so looking at these technologies uh, from a critical point of view, uh, sympathetic to their potential, uh, but really questioning whether it, um, uh, given any context, this is really the optimal solution, uh, is already um, 
a good stance, I think, um, to, to encounter this development. I think you really touch upon, uh, you know, like certain core um, areas that uh, I, I think are key topics of debate in terms of the way that um, a lot of the science is viewed, really, in terms of its utility and how we need to be cautious about that um, right at the beginning. I think this is this is something um, that's, that's um, you know, really, really important to think about right now. But um, maybe, uh, you know, if I, if I could ask you, uh, Dr. Speck, about what, what do you think of the major um, concern? Um, yeah, so I think um, Dr. Kellmeyer just touched on this, but um, one of the things I'm most interested in is, I, I think often in ethics, we focus on, um, the effects of individual technologies on individual people, like very specific uses. Um, I think with AI, just because of the scale, I'm increasingly interested in broader issues, um, like Dr. Kalmeyer said, of structural injustice and inequality, both in terms of how those go into how the technologies are developed, but also in how their impact is unequal on different populations. So, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about bias and AI. I think a really classic example, um, I actually just searched this to see if it still occurs, but a classic example is if you do a Google search for physicist, um, before people started talking about bias and AI, you would get hundreds and hundreds of pages of images of men standing at blackboards. And there was like one picture of a woman standing at a blackboard, but she was a model pretending to be a physicist. Um, and so part of what that's showing is that, I mean, Google isn't misogynist, right? But, or at least the search engine isn't, um, but it's building in the bias that we have in our society that this is what a physicist looks like. And so there are more pictures of male physicists than there are of women. Um, I just did the search again, and actually it's interesting. There's been a lot more talk about bias in AI since I first heard of this example, and now you'll see examples of women, people of color, um, if you do a Google image search for physicists. So I think that's an interesting way to think about how we've had to kind of course correct in how we think about how biases affect artificial intelligence. Um, the other place that I think that this is important is that different populations are disproportionately affected by artificial intelligence than others, depending on the need to use AI to manage big data. So for example, in social welfare programs, um, the use of AI is increasingly common just because these are large data sets and you need some kind of algorithmic analysis to manage that data and figure out who gets social benefits, which social benefits they are, which variables you take into account. And so there's been really fantastic work by, I'll just recommend two books. Um, Virginia Eubanks has a book, Automating Inequality, and Ruha Benjamin has a book, Race After Technology. Both of them look at how AI technologies tend to um, disproportionately affect marginalized groups and people of color, just in terms of the uh, level of AI in affecting their day-to-day -day decisions and kind of their freedom to make their own choices. So I think that's really important. And on a broader scale, um, you know, it's it's often a more social or political issue, but I think neuroethics and people working in AI are increasingly sensitive to it. Yeah, and I think that, that's a really interesting example that you shared there. Um, I think that's something uh, that I'm sure a lot of people are going to think a lot more about now because it's something that we don't we, we don't realize um, how um, biased some of these systems are and these are things that we are actually interacting with on a daily basis. So yeah, there's a, um, we definitely need to think a lot more about how this is influencing, uh, influencing uh, the way that we see things in a whole, a whole host of levels. Um, Dr. Cabrera, can I, can I ask you, what do you think are the, um, you know, the major concerns uh, with advancing AI? Yeah, I think <laughs> this is ha what happens when you're last, right? Like all my, like uh, Laura and Philip already raised a lot of the really key concerns. So I would just emphasize that, yeah, reliability on, on technology. So a lot of our systems already have embedded AI and the more we just blindly, blindly rely on them without really being more critical. I see that as a, 
as a concern. And this kind of builds up also considering the biases that come in this. So if you have, you know, AI for, a, let's say, um, the health like neurologist to diagnose something, but the data set has been only uh, filling with um, or trained using a data set that only includes, you know, white Caucasian men, uh, mainly, uh, then you cannot really generalize, you know, the reliability of, of that diagnostic tool for for a broader population. So that to me is a concern that as we are really uh, embedding and using these um, AI technologies in different uh, neuroscientific uh, uh, tools and, and beyond, obviously. Um, and I guess the, the other uh, concern that I have, so that touches on the reliability and the justice issues or, or the bias issues, uh, the concern I raised uh, earlier about accountability and reliability is one that I'm um, really interested and in. I've been really looking at uh, in the case of, you know, implantable devices, say like deep brain stimulation, um, when you have these adaptive brain implants where you have more embedded AI systems and if something goes wrong, and, and to me, this is where it comes to the, the, the questions about accountability and, re and responsibility. When you have a system that is so, you know, it's in your brain, is is kind of telling you or creating inputs and, out, uh, and outputs, and then how can you know um, who is responsible, who is accountable? And so there's a lot of good literature, um, or at least it's increasing, uh, it's coming up more in terms of, you know, what type of framework we should be using as we create AI systems that are not uh, kind of the weak type of AI where it was easier to determine, okay, of course, the, the AI is just a tool, it's not really incorporating any um, meaningful input uh, in, into the decision process. But here, when you have AIs that truly are more, are, are part of the decision making process, how do we then shift or think about responsibility and accountability? So I think that's, to me, at least, uh, a key concern. And then finally, I guess if we get really good at continue to develop these tools that we really get to create something like really strong AI, then what do we do with such uh, entities and the, the issue of, you know, how do we see them in terms of moral status? I think this might be a little bit more uh, futuristic and, and philosophical, but that to me is also a very interesting uh, question and concern I, I think of. So I, I mean, again, I, th I think this is, uh, you know, you're touching upon so many different aspects and areas that we, uh, you know, we really need to start thinking about. So I mean, I think it's really great for um, people who are um, new to the field to, to, you know, to actually see the various kind of issues that these, uh, you know, that it's it's important to actually think about when we're designing these systems and as these technologies, um, you know, research kind of like improves in these areas. Um, I, I was just wondering, we're talking a lot about um, healthcare uh, related aspects, but what about other aspects of things like, um, you know, um, marketing or, um, you know, like in terms of how, you know, you know, advertising um, and, and stuff gets influenced by um, AI do, I mean, are there any concerns that, um, you know, jump out particularly in the, these kind of areas? Yeah, if I can just, oh, sorry, Laura. Let me just quickly uh, just because I was thinking as I was hearing my colleagues before about the example of you know like these um, these companies that uh, they pair people like single people with others like the, for dating and they're using AI algorithms to pick you know who to pair uh, and I know there's been a couple of shows from um, uh, how's it called this show where uh, I'm blanking on, on the name now but like there's different ways in which AI systems have been embedded. And this is kind of where I raise the issue of reliability, right? Like the more you embed these technologies for different purposes from pairing people for dating sites to, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of systems that also pair people in terms of, you know, suggesting career paths. And so we are really relying on these technologies and we're taking away the, the process of making a critical assessment of what are our values, what are our priorities and make those decisions um, ourselves so kind of Laura yeah I was I was just gonna say I mean I think a, a central thing for everyday people to think about is privacy um, and so I'm just linking to a book um, Chris of Belize has a book called privacy is power which is about um, you know the use of personal data in broader marketing schemes and um, to giving people kind of ideas of how to opt out if they want to. I think I think it's really important just to be informed. You know, every time that you're on a website and you click accept to cookies or you sign a user agreement, 
I think it's really worth having a sense of what you're signing into um, and what you're agreeing to. I mean, even just for people who use um, Google, you can have certain privacy settings. If you're on Facebook, you should check your privacy settings, like any kind of social media, make sure you check your privacy settings. Um, I, I think this is the main place where the public has control over, um, you know, how their data is used and by whom. Yeah, and I think that uh, people should also um, be concerned about the way in which um, the big technology companies and uh, associated um, startups that are now driving uh, much of the research of, and development of um, cutting edge um, AI methods, um, machine learning methods, uh, you know, the big five technology companies that, that can go unnamed here because everyone knows their name. Um, they are also heavily investing in, in neurotechnology uh, and neuroscience. So um, Facebook is just one example, um, has sort of this um, uh, uh, brain uh, reading um, group where they sort of hired a lot of neuroscientists with the idea to invent fundamentally new um, technology, uh, brain-computer interface technology to enable people to, to write with their brain activity. Um, and uh, it's from the outside because um, this research is often not um, um, available in the public domain. It happens behind uh, closed doors, it's, so it doesn't often undergo the usual vetting process that you would find in, in, in academic um, neuroscience. It's very difficult um, to know what is what are marketing claims, what is reality, and what is just um, you know ambition um, or moonshot um, projects. Um, so consider, for example, the, the company Neuralink, just subsidiary of Tesla. Um, so the you know, Tesla CEO or, or now newly dubbed Techno King uh, Elon Musk um, uh, has sort of put out a paper uh, in, on a preprint server, the Archive, which is a respected preprint server for scientific publications, describing the, the work of Neuralink, uh, the scientific work of Neuralink, in which he was the, the sole author of that paper, whereas clearly everything that the, the company does must be a team effort uh, and has to be, you know, based on, 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 on teams of researchers that are working on this stuff. And so this is sort of, in my, in my opinion, um, you know, some, a disregard uh, of the way in which um, evidence-based science should, should actually proceed. Uh, but because these companies have almost infinite means uh, in poaching uh, researchers from, from public research institutions and from, uh, uh, from pursuing these types um, um, of research, it's very, um, you know, it's very difficult um, to resist um, this, um, this development. And so I, so I think um, here, much like in the area of um, consumer entertainment, AI uh, technology, uh, the companies need to be held accountable, uh, held to account uh, to the ways in which they promote, market and um, use their technologies. And so what we are already observing is that in this area of sort of broadly pursued consumer-oriented neurotechnology or direct-to-consumer neurotechnology, um, you know, brain data is, will just be another um, commodity, just like your personal data uh, is now. Uh, it will be a, a part in multimodal data analytics frameworks um, for making inferences um, on, on, on consumer choices or preferences or whatever. So even, even if from a neuroscientific scientific point of view, it would be good to be skeptical about any claim that you know, these, these kinds of uh, devices or apply, applications can actually read thoughts, even though this is sometimes claimed. Um, you know, one, one ought to be very skeptical of that, but uh, brain data in combination with other contextual um, highly personalized data um, will eventually um, enable the companies uh, to make even more precise inferences on, on stuff that you, that you do and stuff that you, uh, that you perhaps um, don't even know you want. Um, and so People should be very um, careful in whether they want to, um, you know, use these kinds of emerging consumer devices, whether they want their brain data out um, 
um, out in the web um, or on the servers of these companies. So I think uh, taking these um, developments um, under scrutiny and critical, uh, critical scholarship is really important at this moment in time because it's a fast moving um, situation. Um, and I think one of the things that you've you've really hired is is about consumer awareness about these things because um, I, I think in a lot of the work that I do as well I see that that varies hugely. Um, so um, you know, not yes, there are um, there are options to say you know, do you accept cookies, for example? But um, I, I think the, just the level of awareness amongst the public about what this actually means. Um, does differ a lot depending on context. Um, so um, I think those are the kind of things that we, um, you know, as a scientific community also probably need to think about a bit uh, more and highlight. Um, I think there are a couple of questions that, that have come in the chat. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think can we, if we could uh, take those on. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what is your take on the human brain project in terms of neuroethics? I'll just say, I mean, I think um, I think one thing it's important to be aware of is there's been a lot of talk about brain projects in different countries as kind of being like a new kind of arms race. And so I think neuroscience is being used politically. Um, and I think it's important for scientists to be aware of how the work that they're doing can play into scientific aims um, or sorry, political aims. One of the uh, first workshops that I went to that was thinking about neuroethics in a global context um, was led by a neuroscientist who brought up the example of the Manhattan Project, where you had physicists working really hard to try to develop um, nuclear technology that turned into uh, weapon technology. And the scientists who were involved in that felt very conflicted that that was, like, that was the outcome of the work that they had done when they thought they were doing basic science. And so I think one thing I would say is just, I think it's important for scientists to be aware of the political ramifications of what they're doing um, and how different countries might want to use their work um, in a more competitive way. I would add, I mean, just based on, on, on how I read the question is, I think the Human Brain Project being the one, you know, held in Europe, um, they do have a big package that is focusing on on ethics and neuroethics led by, I think, some colleagues in Uppsala um, in Sweden. And so I think they've been trying to bring on neuroethics from, from really early on. Same in the kind of in the brain initiative in the US, it's also a very big uh, component of neuroethics. Even in the international brain initiative where there's different human brain projects that are part of it, um, there's an important neuroethics component. I think from that end, it's really nice to see that neuroethics is not just, you know, chat that we have in these uh, nice events, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's been embedded in how these projects are, are taking place, are being developed, and they are at the table. And I think that's a good start for neuroethics to, to have an impact in, in the work that is going on. Yeah, um, I, I mean, again, though, I, I have to say that, you know, coming from uh, India that, uh, you know, again, in the Human Brain Project, again, a lot of these global initiatives are largely more high income country based. So I think that I think it is a start to, you know, when we talk start, when we're talking about these issues, but um, clearly, I think there's a lot more we need to do to incorporate more, um, you know, global diversity within these discussions, because, um, you know, right from the initial discussions that we were having, I think that there is an important role that you know capturing that diversity has towards um, you know contributing to how the science itself develops so um, we, we have another uh, question about are there any concerns that neuroscience based AIs could be used to create invasive advertising technologies maybe yeah I can briefly address this so it depends on what you mean with um, invasive so I, I, I would Sort of address this question by presuming that uh, uh, the person who asked the question means whether we can write, uh, send advertisements directly into the sort of perceptual 
cognitive system um, on, of the brain, like writing in the brain so that the person perceives uh, or is somehow influenced uh, in, uh, for, in, for making any particular kind of, of consumer choice. Uh, and like to that, I would say um, this would require kind of sophisticated and granular brain writing technology that is not that is not foreseeable um, for the time being because it would um, require uh, techniques that um, that would sort of be invasive and that they would have to get very close to the brain um, you know electrodes in the brain that would sort of need to uh, be able to manipulate neural circuits uh, to a degree that is not possible now and not in the near future in my in my opinion but I would sort of turn the question on its head and say, well, what we what we have now, the kinds of advertisements that we're confronted with are already highly invasive. Uh, it's not that they in, in, invade our brain as such, but they invade our mind because they're sort of already uh, tailored um, by sort of a, um, a data analytic driven um, understanding of our needs, of our previous consumer choices. Um, so something like um, recommender systems on the web, where, you know, everywhere where each time when if you see something like, oh, because you purchased this, you might also like this, or because um, uh, people similar to you um, bought this, maybe you like also like this. This is already um, this is already based on a, on a type of deep digital phenotyping uh, in which your, um, you know, your presumed um, choices are analyzed um, to a degree that I would already call invasive because um, it works off of data that you often haven't consciously or explicitly consented to being used for that purpose or in even more cases you have um, consented. Uh, to the data being used by clicking on some, you know, end user license agreement or without giving it any thought. And so I think uh, protecting consumers or people in, in, that, to, in that respect uh, from these kinds of intrusive and invasive um, uh, targeted advertisements, uh, we should move into a sort of a, a kind of opt in rather than opt out environment. So the default in the web is now that you have to opt out from being. Um, from being constantly analyzed and um, uh, uh, and I think the the opposite should be the case uh, in that you would have to explicitly agree if you want your personal data being uh, being used for for things like targeted advertising but that's very difficult because the data economy itself um, is predicated on on the very on this very business model so uh, despite what the the companies tell you um, so, uh, you know, they are, the way they make money is by targeted advertising, so they will always be interested in, in uh, gleaning more insights uh, from your personal data. Um, and so I would consider this already invasive, um, in a sense. Yeah. Um, I think we have another question about uh, Dr. Cabrera mentioned that determining Accountability and responsibility would become increasingly difficult with implantable uh, BMIs. And Dr. Kelman mentioned that the need for regulatory framework, um, what, what kind of regulations do you think are necessary now that we foresee such development in uh, BMIs? Um, Dr. Cabrera, would you like to uh, you know, share your thoughts on that for us? Uh, yeah, well, I'm still working on Kind of on these questions, but I think to start, we really need to rethink how we envision responsibility because I think in the past this has been uh, mostly very individual based. So responsibility is something that we, you know, that individuals have, and and again, all like the legal and, and ethical frameworks that look at responsibility and accountability have been mostly been looking from the, the individual perspective. But now when we have all of these systems, we need to start moving to more. Um, kind of you know relational type of responsibility and, and I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a term for it but I'm, I'm blanking on it where you know how do you when you have systems that have too many hands you know there's too many not only people but too many like systems involved not, not only um, humans how do you distribute responsibility in such systems and I think that requires different frameworks for us to think about responsibility and I don't think the current regulatory frameworks that we have uh, account for that. So we, we first need to rethink that uh, and to be able to come up with a better regulatory framework that address that. Yeah. 
conversation. Um, Dr. Kellerman, do you want to uh, share any quick thoughts on that? Um, yes, I mean, there was a specific, specific question on regulatory frameworks, and I just put, put a, a written answer um, um, into the, uh, the Q&A. Briefly, I would say that this requires a sort of multi-level um, approach in which, you know, you have at the sort of from, from bottom-up perspective, um, you have things like ethical guidelines, professional codes of conduct, for example, you know, what the IEEE is working um, on and other uh, professional bodies um, or doctors or engineers that give themselves sort of um, guidelines, but also uh, national laws and regulations, for example, at the level of consumer protection laws um, to make sure that, you know, neurotechnologies are used in beneficial way, in ways. But ultimately, because these are technologies that transcend national borders, you also also need international efforts for harmonization, uh, maybe at the level, I think, realistically at the beginning, only at the level of sort of soft law declarations, you know, like a UNESCO declaration on AI and neurotechnology or something like that, uh, to be visionary for a second. Um, but but a, a joint uh, and visible effort um, of uh, um, countries uh, to harmonize their approach to, to um, AI and neuro neurotechnology. And that's something that's happening at a lot of different levels. So Chile is currently debating a consumer a neuroprotection um, laws, for example, um, it's one of the first countries in the world. Uh, and so there's a lot of movement also in the political arena in that, uh, in that uh, way and so. I'm, I'm optimistic that these questions will be more and more uh, addressed also at the policy level in recent years, uh, coming years. Thanks. I mean, I think I know, I know we're running short of time and we have some interesting questions. Maybe I could just direct one question to you, uh, Dr. Specker Sullivan. It's, um, is it possible, uh, is it ever possible for AI systems to be conscious? If yes, what could be the positive and negative implications of that? Yeah, I saw that question. It's um, I think it's a great question. And what I'll relate it to is there's a lot of work in neuroethics on um, disorders of consciousness. So minimally conscious state, permanent, um, what's known as persistent vegetative states, but have been called unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. And I'll say, we don't really know what consciousness is. And we're actually pretty terrible at identifying it in human beings. So the only way we can tell if someone is conscious for now is based on behavior, whether or not they respond consistently to certain stimuli, whether or not they give responses to questions, again, that are consistent responses and aren't random or stochastic or something like that. Um, so I think it's the tricky question here is it's possible for a person to be conscious and for our clinical tools to not detect it. That means it's equally possible for artificial intelligence to be conscious and for us to not be able to tell. Um, and so I think the real question here is developing a more refined sense of what is consciousness and how do we actually tell when something has it? Like what clinical tools are we looking for? What, um, what non-clinical tools can we use? So again, great question, but I think until we're better at identifying consciousness, it's hard to figure out what the implications of that would be. Um, thanks. And I, I think on that note, because I, I realize we're running out of time, it's been, I, I just like to thank you all for um, joining in for this, you know, really great uh, panel discussion. Uh,